a screenwriter's idea of a proper credit. And it goes something like this. We haven't quite achieved all of that yet, but we haven't done badly. A screen credit is something we're able to take for granted, but that's today, and every today has a yesterday. There was a time when it was entirely the domain of the producer to decide who and how many people should receive screen credit. It wasn't uncommon that you had to share credit with someone's friend or brother-in-law or girlfriend or boyfriend or you might not have gotten any credit at all. But one thing hasn't changed. Back then, as now, it was only through screen credits that a writer could build a reputation and a career. What is your nationality? I'm a drunkard. <laughs> <laughs> that makes Rick a citizen of the world. I was born in New York City, if that'll help you, honey. They came Understand out in came October 1933. It was a prevailing practice in those days for studios to decide how the credits would read. If the guild were formed for no other reason, there would be enough. Jack hates the ballet. No, I don't hate ballet, Lucille. I loathe it. <laughs> Big difference. I receive a sizable pension. I get residuals about once a week. The working conditions are so different that it would be without the guild, and the new members would never really appreciate it unless they were here in the old days and worked without all those things. I would pity the, the lot of a writer without a guild. Casablanca to Ruben Rubin, 40 years of an illustrious career. But in fact, the history of the Writers Guild of America is even longer, over 50 years. When a young Julius Epstein first came to Hollywood as a beginning screenwriter, he discovered and joined the newly formed Screenwriters Guild. The Screenwriters Guild was the predecessor of today's guild. It was founded by 173 writers who spanned an entire spectrum of philosophies, political leanings, and personalities. But they had some things in common. One was a vision of what writers should be entitled to. Much of that we've achieved, and it represents your benefits as a guild member today. The founders also shared an uncommon dedication to the guild. The fact is that getting this guild off the ground was no simple task, as you'll see it took courage and sacrifice. A handful of these founding members are still with us. One works for the Guild even today. You might recognize Alan Rifkin, who served on our first Guild board and many subsequent ones, who edits the Guild newsletter, and who's handled our public relations for the last 20 years, and that's dedication. Some of the other founding members are going to tell you about our yesterdays. The 
McGill's history belongs to you. We hope that knowing more about it will inspire you to participate in McGill's affairs and help create an even better tomorrow. Give me your help not to win folks alone, but to win in this crusade to restore America to its own people. Hitler aber ist Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler ist. Hitler, Sieg! The early 1930s witnessed the rise to power of vastly different social forces. In Europe, Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany, and fascism began its steady, frightening ascent. By contrast, the fervor of progressive philosophy and policy swept the United States on the heels of Franklin Roosevelt's landslide election victory. Roosevelt's New Deal brought about landmark changes. His National Recovery Administration established the right of employees to organize and bargain, giving a tremendous boost to labor union membership throughout the country. The Writers Guild was born out of this climate of progressive labor activism. Early in 1933, the major studios were claiming they were in serious financial trouble. There were reports of impending shutdowns, which could only be averted by studio personnel taking stiff wage cuts. The technical workers were unionized, and they defied any proposed cuts with the threat of a strike. The studios then turned to the non-organized talent categories. This executive out from New York made a brief and passionate speech. He told us what trouble the company was in, and that all the trouble was the fault of those damn unions, because they had to make contracts with and those contracts bound them. They couldn't cut their salaries, so they had to turn to us as loyal, patriotic Americans. Well, Brian Marlowe, an associate of mine there, a writer, and I, as we were walking out, we looked at each other. He said, that's the answer. You've got to have a union. So let's get back to the office and let's make some calls. One of the writers they found receptive was a flamboyant and successful 25-year-old named John Bright. In The Public Enemy, Bright wrote with a forceful social awareness. In some respects, he almost seems to be commenting on the dilemma of screenwriters. All right, screw. You can sell ours for the same price. There was a widespread nepotism, purely arbitrary allocation of credits, no protection at all. I determined, uh, along with nine others, to uh, to in inaugurate a program uh, that for the writers to organize around. On February third. Bright met Lester Cole and Brian Marlowe at the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel. Seven other writers joined them, several of whom had been active in establishing the Dramatist Guild in the New York Theater and saw the need for a similar effort in Hollywood. The idea of a writer's union was quickly embraced. It took only a few weeks to gather some 500 writers for the first formal meeting held at the Old Writers Club building at 6700 Sunset Boulevard. And the idea was to get the writers to commit themselves not to take any cut in salary until we got recognized. But anyone who did took a cut in salary from the producers could not be a member of this Writers Guild. Well-known playwright John Howard Lawson was elected the first president. There were 173 founding members who contributed not only their enthusiasm, but just as importantly, their money, the equivalent of over $1,000 each. A good number of the formation group that were responsible for the beginnings of the Guild were established and capable and prosperous writers and that they contributed money as well as their time and risked 
their employment uh, in order to establish the guild uh, to, to a considerable degree, help those that didn't have the clout. Sonia Levine, Lillian Hellman, Dorothy Parker, I think they truly envisioned that the time must come uh, that we must have representation. And I think the little guys that came in needed it. And I, I, I know it sounds corny to say they were altruistic, but I believe they were. These prominent writers were in such demand that their jobs were relatively secure in spite of their activism. So they were better able than the beginning writers to withstand the immediate antagonism toward the Guild. And there was a lot of antagonism. And it got back to Thalberg and, and Schulberg and all the others practically at once. Uh, they knew it. And almost immediately started to scream, Reds, Reds. A reasonable number of writers that regarded themselves as slightly above the common herd that they were artists and therefore should have nothing to do with uh, labor organization as such. This is what Irving Thalberg said somewhat later. He said, you're not plumbers, you're artists. And artists don't need unions. And this was at a time that he said that when plumbers were making more than the artists were. So when Jack Warner heard that I was on this awful thing called the Screenwriters Guild. He said, uh, unless you get off this damn nonsense, you're fired. It so happened that Warner Brothers had kept, picked up my option a couple of weeks before. And I, so I had to tell Jack Warner that I thanked him very much. He made it possible for me now to work for the next 40 weeks for the Guild on the Warner Brothers payroll. The next three years were a period of bitter deadlock, as the studios refused to recognize the Guild. In May of 1935, Roosevelt's NRA was declared unconstitutional, which weakened the Guild's position. That summer, Congress passed another New Deal measure, the Wagner Labor Relations Act. It established the National Labor Relations Board, guaranteeing the workers of eligible industries the right to choose a union by majority vote. A short time later, the Guild's opposition nearly succeeded in destroying it. See, the Guild first thought of it really as a social club with Rupert Hughes and those people. These, those were not really Guild members. The crunch came when the studios decided to fight the Guild, and, and the social element became the leaders of the screenplay rights. The Guild's predecessor was the Writers' Club. Many of its members, such as Rupert Hughes, James McGuinness, and Patterson McNutt, had opposed the very concept of a writers' union. They were themselves politically conservative, and since most worked at MGM, were closely allied with Louis B. Mayer and Irving Thalberg. After gaining seats on the Guild Executive Board, McGinnis and McNutt abruptly resigned. They and 125 others then announced the formation of the Screen Playwrights, a rival organization which had clearly been in preparation for some time. Because when they announced that they were ready, they had a constitution, they had the whole thing set up, and 24 hours later, people were signing in. The screen playwrights never numbered more than about 150. Nevertheless, they were a formidable opponent. Members of the screen playwrights were hired and got paid. And they also saw to it that members of the Screenwriters Guild uh, were not hired. The threat was there that when your option came up, if you were a member of the Guild, you'd have to have some very big successes to be renewed. Membership dwindled to 92 by the end of the summer. Unable to pay the rent, the guild offices were vacated and legal notice of dissolution was filed. Mr. Roosevelt, won't you please run again? All we want you to do it, you have to go through it again. The remaining guild members were encouraged by Roosevelt's landslide victory in the 1936 election. 
If the Supreme Court upheld the Wagner Act, then the Guild could force an election and hopefully be certified as the Union for Screenwriters. And when the Wagner Act was upheld, it publicly exploded in a raucous meeting at the Hollywood Athletic Club with over 400 writers attending. In 1938, the Labor Board ruled that screenwriting qualified as labor and set an election for June 28th. Recruiting on both sides reached a fever pitch with the studios pressuring on behalf of the playwrights. Happily, the Screenwriters Guild swept the studios, even winning at Screen Playwrights Stronghold MGM by a two to one margin. Do not let yourselves be tainted by a barren skepticism now discouraged by the sadness of certain hours that creep over nations. We had repeated meetings with the producers from 1936 to 1940, and absolutely nothing would be accomplished. They, perfect, they said they would abide by the decision of the, uh, of the Labor Board uh, to uh, talk, and that's all they were bound to do. They did not have to give us a contract. Despite the election, no direct labor board action could be taken until early 1939. All that could be done was to continue to negotiate. Well, I was the chairman of the negotiating committee, and we had some very stormy meetings with the producers. One stormy session, Harry Warner gave expression to some obscenities and Eddie Mannix at our next bargaining meeting wanted to set the record straight and said that he didn't uh, mean what he said when he told us that he would uh, fire anyone who was subversive from, from the studio. And we said that, that that sounded like a blacklist. And uh, Harry Warner, uh, who wasn't at the meeting, Jack Warner was at the, the meeting, at, at the second meeting, said, oh no, no blacklist, we would, uh, there would never be a blacklist at Warner Brothers, we'd do it all by the telephone. At this time, the House Un-American Activities Committee made its first foray into Hollywood under the chairmanship of Martin Dyes. It marked the beginning of the witch hunts, which would eventually blur any distinction between anti-fascism, liberalism, communism, and just plain outspokenness. The studios took advantage of the publicity, saying they would not sign a contract with subversives. The first and fundamental fact is that what started as a European war has developed as the Nazis always intended it should develop into a war for world domination. It was becoming clear that the United States would soon become involved in the war. The Guild leadership called an emergency meeting in the spring of 1941 at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel to press for a contract. The membership voted unanimously in favor of a strike. The producers then hurriedly offered a minimum basic agreement to the writers in the interest of harmony and patriotism and uh, pulling together to, to save the country and so forth. I ask that the Congress declare that... It wasn't until after Pearl Harbor that we, we got the uh, minimum basic the agreement. And uh, the only thing, the mm. only substantial thing that we got as a result of that agreement was the control of screen credits. After nine long years of struggle, it may not have seemed like a great deal. But that agreement guaranteed minimum salaries at more than double what most writers were earning, and more importantly, it established once and for all the basis for all future negotiations between writers and producers on which the present guild was built. Guild matters now took a back seat to the war. Those remaining at home devoted much of their energies to the war effort. That sentiment even found its way into the movies. Hilda, I'm no good at being noble, but it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. 
Someday you'll understand that. Now, now. He's looking at you, kid. For the Guild, the war years were relatively uneventful. As the war drew to a close, however, riders looked forward to building on the gains of a dozen years of struggle and waiting. Communism in reality is not a political party. A shift in the mood of the nation would bring about a considerably different outcome. By the time Roosevelt arranged the conference at Yalta, Joseph Stalin had replaced Hitler in the minds of many as the personification of world evil. Roosevelt himself had barely won the 1944 election. By the time of his death, the long repressed backlash against the New Deal had begun and the Cold War was well underway. As always, screenwriters seemed acutely aware of the climate of the times. It's terrible when you see a guy like you that had to sacrifice himself, and for what? We let ourselves get sold down the river. We were pushed into war. Sure, by the Japs and the Nazis, so we had... Oh, the Germans and the Japs had nothing against us. They just wanted to fight the Limeys and the Reds. And they would have whipped them, too. We didn't get deceived into it by a bunch of radicals in Washington. What are you talking about? We fought the wrong people, that's all. The Guild was a highly visible target for Roosevelt's opponents. And in 1944, Conservatives in Hollywood formed the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. Many members on their executive board were former screen playwrights. The Alliance enjoyed broad support, owing to growing post-war hysteria. I think maybe it's suddenly not having a lot of enemies to hate anymore. Maybe it's because for four years now we've been focusing our mind on on one little peanut. The win the war peanut, that was all. Get it over. Eat that peanut. All at once, no peanut. Now we start looking at each other again. We don't know what we're supposed to do. We don't know what's supposed to happen. We're too used to fighting. But we just don't know what to fight. A whole lot of fight and hate that doesn't know where to go. The House Un-American Activities Committee made another foray into Hollywood, this time under the aegis of J. Parnell Thomas. Thomas was warmly greeted by the Motion Picture Alliance, which praised the committee's assessment of communist propaganda in films. Numerous others met with the committee. At the conclusion of his visit, Thomas announced that 90% of communist infiltration in Hollywood is to be found among screenwriters. On September 19, 1947, 19 unfriendly witnesses were subpoenaed to Washington, of whom 15 were screenwriters. Of the 10 who were later called to testify, nine were screenwriters. I repeat the question, Mr. Lawson. Have you ever held any position in the Screenwriters Guild? It is absolutely beyond the power of this committee to inquire into my association with any organization. You have to stop. Are you, are you not a member of the Screenwriters Guild? The question of conscience and constitutional rights are not simple matters to me. It has nothing to do with constitutional rights, Mr. Ornitz. Mr. Uh, Mr. Scott would like to know whether or not you were ever a member of the Screenwriters Guild. I believe I've answered your question, Mr. Stripling. Uh, Mr. Bieberman, are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild, or have you ever been a member of the Screenwriters Guild? Now, Mr. Stripling, I would like to reply to this very quietly, Mr. Chairman Orson. If I will not be interrupted, I will attempt to give you a full answer to this question. It has become very clear to me that the real purpose of this investigation... That is not the question! Why, that is the question! That is the question! That is the question! That is the question! It's very simple to answer the question, and the times when I feel it's proper, right. I will, but when I wish to stand So the first question they asked was, are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild? If you answer that, you were forced by the rules of the committee to answer every other question they asked. So, on that question, I and others stalled, and we said, we want to tell the story in our way. 
When we started that, they cut us off and they said, well, answer now, are you or are you not? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And then when you tried to answer that, they cut you off and cited you for contempt of Congress. But the point is, had you answered, yes, I was, for example, I'd been president of the guild, I'd been vice president, a member of the board 10 times. It was known all over that I was a member. But I could not say that I had been because that would have obliged me under their rules to answer every other question that they may have asked. And included, if you did say, yes, I am a member of the Communist Party, the next question was, and who were the other members you knew? Boys brought it on themselves. They're such goddamn idiots. Why were they stupid? I mean, I'm talking about my, our so-called Hollywood ten. I have nothing but the greatest contempt for them, and they know it, too. In a sad way, I kept very much to myself. People that I respected, uh, a couple of very close friends, who were very angry at me. I, I, in fact, one person told me that whether I liked it or not, I was politically stupid. Well, I wasn't politically stupid. I had foresight, and I, I, I was afraid of where all of this was leading. This ordeal nearly tore the guild apart. There were guild members who were communists. There were also extreme conservatives. But the majority of the members were somewhere in between. The guild president at that time, Emmett Lavery, in testimony before the committee, described the membership as, in his words, liberal center. He was asked if the communists were strong enough to control the guild. I don't think in a group of writers it's possible for them to get away with it. Have you ever tried to organize a group of writers to do anything? <laughs> On the morning of November 24th, the House of Representatives cited the Hollywood Ten for contempt of Congress. Each eventually served a year in prison and were blacklisted from working in the industry. That afternoon, the producers issued a declaration from New York, the Waldorf Astoria Statement, which formally instituted the blacklist. Anyone named by anyone in secret testimony as being or having been a communist was banned from working. No trial, no cross-examination. We will not re-employ any of the 10 until such time as he is acquitted or has purged himself of contempt. Eventually, over 200 screenwriters and countless others were blacklisted. Somehow, we got here from there. We survived it, and we grew. We took on more new members, joined with radio writers and television writers, and went on to become the Writers Guild of America. But not without the support of our membership. That has never changed and never will, and not without what was given us by our founding members. Here's to the writers singing out clear as a bell. We're still here. One year Mercedes, next year Toyota to sell. But we're here. What if our agent never calls? What if some critic breaks our balls? We may have taken some falls on our rear. We've had more fun than King Lear, and we're here. We've tangled with Aubrey and Charlotte and Paley. We in the Writers Guild West. We had to take crap from executives daily. We've been screwed by the best. Screen, cinema scope and 3D. We're still here. Nielsen and Trandex, network and cable TV. We're still here.